unsolved mysteries. Did D.B. Cooper survive his daring leap from a hijacked plane? Join me for this intriguing story. And perhaps you may be chosen by fate to help solve a mystery. On Thanksgiving Eve, 1971, a man who identified himself as D.B. Cooper walked into the airport in Portland, Oregon. According to FBI agent Ralph Himmel's back, there was nothing unusual about him. He was your typical businessman, a suit, a tie, a raincoat, carrying an attache case. Nothing distinctive about him except perhaps for the fact that everything was very dark. Black tie, black raincoat, black shoes. He appeared at the ticket counter, bought his ticket, and just gave the name Cooper. This is a police sketch of D.B. Cooper. This is all they have. Just a witness's description. Cooper wanted assurances that the plane was a 727. Agent Himmelsbach explained why. The 727 became notorious through this case because it is the only airliner from which a successful parachute jump can be made from the passenger cabin. D.B. Cooper bought a one-way ticket to Seattle. His only luggage was a briefcase. He was the last person to board the plane. He took his seat while the 727 begins taxing the runway. Flight attendant Florence Schaffner was the first crew member to talk to Cooper. This is a photo of Florence Schaffner, the only witness to see and talk to D.B. Cooper. She states, he handed me a note and he kept looking at me and I just ignored him the first time he looked at me and then he said, I want you to read the note. It was printed. Miss, I have a bomb in my briefcase. I want you to sit beside me. This is what a representation of the bomb looked like. Typical bomb with dynamite, wires attached to a timer in his briefcase. Cooper opened his briefcase so Florence could see what was inside. She states, I saw a big battery with six dynamite sticks wrapped around the battery. And he said to me, all I have to do is attach this wire to this gadget here and we'll all be dead. And so began one of the most infamous unsolved crimes in U.S. history. To this day, no one knows the true identity of the man who called himself D.B. Cooper. Or if he survived his daring parachute leap from 10,000 feet, the case remains the only unsolved skyjacking in the world. Flight attendant Florence Schaffner went to the cockpit to inform the crew about Cooper and his threat. She recalled 
We were very, very scared to death. All of us were. I was thinking about dying. That's all I thought. I was also thinking I'll never see my parents, my brother, and sisters. The flight crew immediately notified air traffic control about the hijacking. They, in turn, contacted the FBI. According to Agent Himmelsbach, Cooper's demands were precise. He wanted $200,000 in cash and a knapsack and four parachutes. He identified the parachutes as two front pack parachutes and two backpacks. And he specified that the airline remain in the air until the money and the parachutes were ready in Seattle. He also specified that the other passengers not be told that the airplane was being hijacked. The flight crew proceeded as if nothing was out of the ordinary. Drinks were served. Cooper ordered two bourbon and waters. Meanwhile, the FBI communicated with the airline. Agent Himmelsbeck said the airline agreed to pay the ransom. The FBI asked the airline what their approach to the hijacking was going to be. That is, did they wish to pay the ransom? This is an option that the victim of extortion has rather than law enforcement. And they responded instantly that they wished to pay the ransom. And so the FBI at Seattle set out assisting in obtaining the money. Each bill was photographed and the serial numbers recorded. Cooper also insisted the plane be refueled immediately once it landed in Seattle. No passengers were to be released until all of his demands were met. He also instructed that once it landed, the plane should stay on the runway rather than the taxi up to the terminal. At 5.43 p.m., Flight 305 landed in Seattle. The plane taxied in and was parked in a remote area of the field. And according to Agent Himmelsbeck, the bags of ransom money were brought aboard. They were carried on board by a flight attendant. There were $10,020 bills assembled in straps of 100 bills to a strap. An individual straps held together with rubber bands. The money alone, just the currency, weighed 21 pounds. Four parachutes were also delivered. Both the flight crew and the FBI were worried that Cooper would use the extra parachutes to take hostages along with him. The passengers on board were completely unaware of the drama. Surrounding them, which included FBI snipers and normal FBI agents. During the time the airliner was on the ground at Seattle, there were FBI agents with scoped rifles who were prepared. If the indications were present, they required it to pick him off. Finally, the passengers were allowed to deplane, but Cooper demanded that the flight crew and one attendant stay on board. Florence Schaffner recalled her conversation with the co-pilot. The co-pilot said, you better get out of here now. So I left without Tina, and that's when he decided to keep her because he was getting suspicious of everything. The passengers were met by FBI agents. It was only then that they realized that the plane had been hijacked and that their lives had been in mortal danger the whole time. When debriefed, they could remember nothing about the man with the briefcase.
Cooper ordered the pilot to fly from Seattle all the way to Mexico City. At a height of 10,000 feet and a speed of only 200 miles an hour. He agreed to refuel in Reno, Nevada. According to Agent Hamill's book, Cooper then made an unusual request. He wanted the rear stairwell to be lowered prior to takeoff. The pilot explained that he wasn't able to take off with that door open. And they argued back and forth, and finally the pilot said he just couldn't fly the airplane and wasn't going to try. And the hijacker consented for the door to be closed for takeoff, which it was. At 7.37, Flight 305 took off. The Seattle control tower altered all other aircraft to remain clear. Cooper's 727 had the sky to itself. Cooper then told the remaining flight attendant to go into the cockpit. He told her to go back into the cockpit and to close the curtain between the coach and the first class cabin. As she turned around to close the curtains, she said she saw him tying something to his waist and what she thought was a rope. Later in the cockpit, the light flashed, indicating that the hijacker was attempting to operate the door. At 8.12, the pilot told us that they were experiencing a rapid change in the air pressure reflected in an ear-popping experience. Upon landing in Reno, Nevada, every inch of the 727 was examined for clues as to who D.B. Cooper really was. We left behind no identifiable fingerprints, no personal items, and no clue to his identity. The flight attendants who had seen Cooper up close helped create a composite drawing of his face. Here's the composite drawing again. The crew felt that Cooper had jumped somewhere near the southern tip of Washington State. It was believed that he would be found in the area bordered by Lake Merwin and ending 20 miles north of Portland. No matter where Cooper landed, Frank Hale believes he could have survived. Let's say he went down in the water. You've got to know how to manage the parachute. You can use it for some flotation. Now his life expectancy is not going to be very long in the water. It's cold and you have to think of the time of year it was in. So he had probably a very, very few minutes to get on shore. But I think he could have done this. Some feel that Cooper could never have survived in that rugged terrain, dressed only in a business suit. The search for D.B. Cooper continued with no new clues. Then in November 1978, a hunter deep in the Washington forest discovered a plastic sign from a 727. It had been ripped from the lower stairwell of Flight 305. Fifteen months later, an even more dramatic discovery was made. On February 10th, 1980, a family was preparing a barbecue on the shore of the Columbia River, 20 miles southwest of Cooper's supposed jump point. They planned to dig a fire 
but dug up something else. Stacks of waterlogged bills totaling $5,880. Agent Himmelsbach confirmed it was part of Cooper's ransom. Many believe that D.B. Cooper survived, and some even think he may have struck again. Only five months after Cooper's flight, a um, half million dollars was extorted by another hijacker. He was a former Green Beret, and his name was Richard McCoy. This is Richard McCoy during an arrest to be witnessed as a possible suspect as D.B. Cooper. He was sentenced to 45 years for air piracy, but he escaped and he was killed in a gun battle with the FBI. Due to the resemblance between their pictures, some believe that D.B. Cooper and Richard McCoy are the same man. Florence worked with Marilyn Coleman, a forensic artist from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Together they created a new portrait of D.B. Cooper. Florence said Cooper's face she'll never forget. Who was D.B. Cooper? Did he survive? And if not, Where's his body and the remaining $194,000? We may never know the truth. For every mystery, there is someone who knows the truth. Perhaps it's you.